Yeah. Suddenly you're standing in darkness. It's wild. Way up there. Well, and Pete Scarpa was in the middle of the elevator going down, and the elevator stopped, and he couldn't get up or down. And I couldn't get down. They had to bring ladders in. It was like Kazumoto. It was like, you know, I was like looking down from Notre Dame, you know? Where? You know, then uh, Columbia picked up success. Columbia had a deal with General Cinema, which was the, and a German tax shelter company had financed success, and Columbia picked it up as part of a package. And uh, they saw the first cut of the picture, and in their judgment, they, did, they felt it was an art movie, and therefore w wouldn't, couldn't justify the expenditure that they would have to make to release it. You know, it cost millions of dollars. It cost as much to release that movie, practically, as it would have, it just did to make it. And it wasn't that cheap to make success. Uh, so what happened was that one guy was, uh, you know, I had these two things. That sounds like a bad luck story, but it, it isn't really. I mean, I, it, the guys who were buying the picture success for Columbia were on their way out. They went to Fox. The new people came in, never saw success. So a long time of sitting there for a year. Then I got to fix the parts of it, and I got to keep working on it. Because I keep working, I don't know, I may be doing, I would still be working on these movies years from now, or maybe not, you know. So I was, kept working on it, and then I made a whole new version that nobody had seen. And then when I came, I was invited by Lincoln Center, Wendy Key's Lincoln Center Film Festival, to come and show success just before the opening of the festival on a Saturday night, and I did. And that's when people said, when is this movie going to, this is Winter Kills, sorry. People said, when is Winter Kills going to be released? And I realized that, a lot of people hadn't seen it, didn't know it was going to be released. And then I, and, and somebody, a, a critic named Seth Cajun, had seen success. And he said, you know, that's a wonderful movie. Why? And I said, well, it's, it's you know, they're not distributing. It's shelves. And then later on, I just, I thought, well, there's a saying from Napoleon. Napoleon said, I didn't steal the throne of France. It was lying in the gutter, and I picked it up. And I realized, that here's inventory. If you look at it just as real estate, it's $30 million worth of a product that's sitting there, that, that is orphaned. Nobody really cares about it. The people at Columbia never saw it. The people at Embassy who had a, uh, winter kills were already gone. So I thought, uh, just the fact that it's valuable that way, and there are theaters, and they need products. So I undertook to negotiate it back. And meanwhile, I spoke to Wendy Keys and Fernando Nosos, who runs the public theater. He said he'd play it. So I went and through a guy named Dennis Dolph, who's head of non-theatrical division at Columbia, I booked success, it was then called American Success, at the, in the public theater, through the non-theatrical division. At the same time, I continued negotiation with a major division at Columbia. The movie was about to open in New York, and, the, and I got a, a call from the uh, business manager at Columbia, the attorney, and he said, uh, I said, good morning, because I'm trying to get a hold of him, because I wanted to find out if he was going to give me the rights back to success. He said, it's not a good morning for me, Mr. Richard, and it's not going to be a good morning t for you either. I said, oh, why is that? He said, I understand that uh, success is going to be shown at the public theater in New York City. I said, that's right. And he said, that's a paying theater? I said, oh, yes, it is. And he said, and the critics are going to see it on Sunday? I said, that's right. He said, you're in breach of contract, Mr. Richard. He said, I demand that you desist the showing of this picture. In return, all prints of the Columbia pictures at once. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, anybody can book this picture. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you just call up and you rent the picture from the hall. I said, you got the thing and you call up and you rent it. I said, you just, you know, and so we just rented it and now we're showing it, and we can show it to anybody. He said, you mean we booked that picture? I said, that's right. He said, why didn't anybody tell me this? He said, if you're right, I'm going to take you to the lunch at the best place you know. I said, okay. So he got back on. He said, all right. He said, where do you want to have lunch? I said, well, I will have lunch when I come back from New York. And because the fact of the matter is, is that nobody, I mean, a studio is just a place to work, finally. It's a, it's a, it's a space. And in that space, there are a lot of people. And the idea of like, you know, David and Goliath aspect of it, they're guys you can talk to. And he thought it was all funny. In fact, everybody that I met at Columbia think it's very good that now I managed to get the picture and, I, and I'm opening it. And they kind of support that idea. But what happens in the corporations is a mystery, the way it happens to me. What happens a lot of times in Congress is a mystery to me. In the, you know. Well, it seems, you know, the, the parallels almost to, to winter kills even and the whole... Well, it's the same. Well, now what's happened is that now I'm getting with my friends to release my movies. I'm getting as the picture maker to work on the, you know, everybody talks about, oh, the ad campaign sucked and this was no good and that was no good and if only this had happened, it was the wrong theater and if you left to go, we, well, now all those mistakes are mine and my friends. And so I've spent the last year learning exhibition and learning distribution and I found out you can go in and rent a theater like you rent a hall and, that, and, and it's certain out of town, out of New York, the theaters will pay for the advertising. If they believe in the movie, they'll front it. 
We opened Success in Los Angeles. It ran in 11 weeks when we opened it for $5,500. And studios will tell you it takes a quarter of a million to 300000 or a budget now. I read in Variety the other day, it's gone up to $20 million. Well, you know, there are a lot of different kind of movies. If every movie has to have the pressure of making so much money back, it means that in fewer and fewer stars are called bankable. Eventually, you'll only be able to make one movie with one star. So somehow, out, you have to. You can find a way to work. Not, not. You don't even have to break the system. You just have to step outside it. And there's a parallel. There's another dimension out there, and it's much more welcoming, I think, than most people imagine. I, I remember when Winter Kills was being double billed with Phantasm. Phantasm, which was a low-budget horror movie that AFCO released. Well, I was told, you know, when, when I went to Seattle, they, they released the, the first place Winter Kills opened was a little theater in Seattle, which is where I could afford because I didn't have to pay anything. And I managed to get, you know, I had one print of Winter Kills, and I opened it at the Pikes Place Cinema in Seattle, and it broke the house record. And it was all these articles. And I, and, and I said, but it was already released there. I said, it's amazing. It was already shown. And the critic, John Hartle, uh, and, and uh, Richard Jameson, who Richard Jameson, who became a real supporter of the movie and the bees, but it's like there are certain people who really help out, help you out if you can get to them. And I would say to a lot of picture makers, you know, that there's a whole world outside, and we, you keep banging on the wrong door, they'll never admit you. It's like the studios, guys like me. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I'm wasting my time going to try to explain to some vice president of production an idea I have for a movie. I might as well be Chinese, you know. So I have to find, but there are a lot of people who understand, and they're not necessarily. Anyway, it broke the house record in Seattle when it opened there, and it turned out that Winter Kills when it opened Seattle, played eight miles out of town on the bottom half of a double bill with the onion field. And so on paper, yes, it was released in Seattle, but it wasn't really. It was shown in Chicago, it was in Chicago on a Wednesday, I understood, and understand, and was out by Saturday. But that doesn't give a movie much of a chance. So you have to give yourself a chance, that's what... But the lesson I've learned is that uh, I can't expect things from, you know, we keep looking for answers, like the studio people, that, because they're head of advertising, they must know something about advertising. Not true. Because he's head of production, that means he can tell good stories. It's just the opposite. Very often people get to high positions representing other people by the very virtue of the fact that they don't understand and they can talk to money, but that doesn't mean they can talk to you or that they're, anyway, I don't want to go into that. Now, finally, Winter Kills and Success are being re-released by the Invisible Studio, the company that you formed with Claire Townsend. That's right. And now, and, and Claire and I, you know, spent a lot of time now talking to independent. She had connected to a lot of independent exhibitors through uh, Robert Redford Sundance Institute, and I went up there and through that, you know, they had a whole retinue. There are six hundred independent exhibitors in America, and if you can make movies. That and, and own them in some way or have control of them, there are a lot of independents you can go to and make deals with. And eventually, because a picture costs enough, so much money, it has to have a wider audience than your friends. Otherwise, you can't keep making it. You know, you, you can write books or plays, and, you know, but then they have to be exhibited. So you, you always have that problem. So I'm trying to find w ways, and we're trying to find ways to deal with it directly, to go to the people with the money directly, and to go with the people with the theaters directly. And we'll see if it works. If it does, it opens up a whole range of... Well, it does for uh, every... Yeah. And if it does... I mean, if I can do it, a lot, anybody can do it. You know? Well, I mean, I have a high motivation. Anybody with a high motivation. What kind of plans do you have for the Invisible Studio in terms of production? Well, the idea of the Invisible Studio is for it not to exist. I mean, when I first wanted a company, I thought the worst thing to have is a company. Because if you have a company, you have to go to work every day. Because all these people are expecting you to show up. You know, you never know who you work for. It's like being a director. You're a director, right? You've got to be there right on time because all these people, you work for all these people. You work for the people who drive the... Every, you work for everybody. It's like, you know, I mean... So, I don't want to have a company because then I have to go to an office and I have to deal with accountants and I have to deal with lawyers and all that stuff. So what the Invisible Studio is, is something that goes away every time it's not needed. And when you need it, it's like the Seven Samurai. You make the calls to the guys and they come together again. And that's the kind of independence we want to preserve, see? So what happens to it when I'm, the, when I'm making my movies is I'll, you know, use whoever I know to get the financing and get people to read the script and then make the picture and hopefully distribute it. But I'm not, I don't want to enforce any demands on it. I don't want to push it into being. If it exists, it'll be there. So I don't know what's going to happen with the Invisible Studio. 
It's invisible. What do you think of the future of cable TV for filmmakers? Well, first of all, it opens up. First of all, on television, you can do a lot with close-ups. It has another demand. It has another. The, the, it means that I even had this idea that I can make. I have a script that I'm working on. That I like to do because I made my documentaries for, you know, seventy-five thousand dollars each, and they were blown up to thirty-five, and they were shown in theaters. And so it occurred to me that you could make a film because still the optical quality of a picture is better than the optical quality of of cable at the moment. The cameras is just the visual look of it. But I can make shoot something in let's say sixteen millimeter because it doesn't know the difference between sixteen or thirty five. I mean, I, I made a first position a ballet film in super sixteen, and just put it right on tape, and sell it to cable. And I had this idea that then if you did it and put it right on tape and sold it to cable, then from the money you sold it to cable, you could blow it up and put it in theaters because some people like theaters. It's a different experience. I guess what I'm saying is that cable is just another place to work. And it's just another audience and another opportunity to tell stories. Tell us about the president's daughters, the documentary that you did a number of years ago, in which you interviewed. Well, it's 1969, and I interviewed Julie and Julie and uh, Trisha in the White House, and Linda and Lucy, Linda in in, in the Virginia, and Lucy Johnson in Texas. And the idea was showing the presidency through the eyes of the daughters, because it's not all these. They were living daughters of the American presidents. And then we had Margaret Truman helped me get them together. And then um, I went and saw Anna Roosevelt. But the White House, we had a screening of it, and 60 Minutes picked it up, and they made a rough cut of it, and they took it down to screen at the White House. And Don Hewitt called me at the end of that screening, and he said, Bill, the White House doesn't like this. He said, I mean, I really don't, don't like it. But they, what they did was they put on the... Um, but they were very... I asked each daughter 110 questions beginning with the first memory she had of her father. You know, and I asked, like, uh, I remember Julie Eisenhower talk, I asked, like, what, what, what was the first night in the White House? And Julie told me about how, you know, the dad kept walking around, looking out, and said, you know, can you believe we're here, you know? And she said, and the first place he wanted to go was Eisenhower's kitchen. And then I found out later that Eisenhower used to make stew in the kitchen and would never let his vice president up in that part of the White House. So, and there were, but there were little things, I mean, you know, I remember that I remember being in the red room and Julie Eisenhower was sitting there and they were demonstrating in the streets and they were bombing Cambodia and uh, he had just made a speech the night before it was in 69 I don't remember what exactly it was but it was one of those major moments you know when everybody was freaked out about what was going to happen next and I said how do you you know like last night I mean do you give input into your father's work and she said oh yes she said you know, last night he called me at the dorm and uh, asked me how I liked the speech. And she said, and I, I went around and I asked the other girls in the dorm how, what they felt about Daddy's speech and what he was saying. And she said, and you know, we at the college, we have a great cross-section of America. I mean, we have girls, this girl from Hawaii, we have girls from Texas and Utah. And, um, and so I give him, you know, I give him the feedback about how his speech went over. And... Uh, and I was sitting there in the White House, and I said, first of all, I didn't know what I was doing in the White House. We drove up with a truck with a big dove painted on the side, all these long-haired guys, and Secret Service men were literally following us into the bathrooms and stuff. But it was just an idea. It was the idea of the president's daughters. And Margaret Truman said, nobody ever asked me that. And she opened, helped open those doors. Anyway, there I was sitting there, and then I was realizing, and, and I said, well, you know, so he really checks with you as about speech? And she said, oh, yes, and me and Tricia, and we're about the only ones I guess he really does talk to after that. And I thought the president of the United States now is now here in the and this is now and I'm sitting across from this girl, and she's the one who gives him primary feedback on what happens. Now. So that was the first idea I got. And so later on, Condon, in one sense, was a piece of cake, having dealt with the White House in this particular level, you know, and then talked to Linda Johnson and to Lucy about. I mean, I remember her talking about Lyndon Baines Johnson would be sitting in front of three television sets at 11 o'clock at night. Lucy said, I'd go in to kiss him. She said, and he'd be watching the news. She said, and they'd be, and I remember her doing this, she said, they'd be sticking him and stabbing him and sticking him and stabbing him. And I'd go in and I'd kiss him goodnight. And he'd look and she said, but he wouldn't know who I was. And just this, this image of Johnson sitting there in this dining room, you know, you can see him watching these monitors and not recognizing when his kid came in. I mean, it's just... And I saw all these home movies of LBJ playing. I mean, it was an amazing idea. 
and it was, you know, and I don't know where the footage is, and uh, my lawyers tell me it's probably better if I just forgot about it. I have enough, I just want to go on. And now I'm glad that Winter Kills is letting me go finally, because now that it opens, I can let it go. I mean, I don't know who had who, whether it was my determination or somehow this movie's determination to get out, you know? It must be a kind of redemptive feeling finally to know that your two films are indeed going to... Well, they're going to be released. I mean, just the word release suddenly had a whole new meaning for me because now I'm being released from them. And, uh, and, the, and the one thing I know is that you don't have to take no for an answer. I don't know how many people told me to forget about it, you know, and just let the pictures go. And so maybe there'll be a disaster, you know. I haven't opened yet. But the fact is, is that I don't know why I would have to spend another three or four years getting a movie together so that I could say to people, well, I've directed a film, I want to direct another one, when I have two perfectly good movies that anybody can go see and realize that I'm, pr I'm pleased with them. You know, I like them, and my friend likes them, and my kid likes them. Yeah. You worked a lot with Eva and Passer. Yes, I did. And as a producer and as a writer. Uh, what, did, what did you learn working, working with him? Well, Ivan is totally... Uh, well, see, he got out of Prague. He, you know, one night he got up, got out of bed, and somebody called him, and he went to the edge of a city, and he saw a thousand tanks rumbling towards his city from Russia, all over the horizon, out of the darkness, you know? And he got, and he went, and he woke Milos up, and they decided, that, you know, that the safest thing for them to do was just to get in. So they got out of the country. Ivan used to say that he made movies to, you know, that uh, movies liberated him from, you know, Czechoslovakia. They were a way for him to get out. And somehow working with him and listening to his stories, first of all, I'm, I know what freedom is a lot more. I mean, we take it for granted. I mean, all, I have friends will say, are you kidding? You think America's free? Well, it is pretty free. I mean, if it supports a guy like me and allows me to work and talk and talk to you, it's very free compared to his experience. So I would think about his experience and his fearlessness, uh, and he's fearless. And, and so it was a good lesson for me because he's not... I mean, we were working on a picture in, um, called Crime of Passion, and I came over there, and I was ostensibly going to go skiing. It was after I produced Law and Disorder. He said, so Beale, you know, you come and you go skiing, and you have a great time. I arrived, he gave me three screenplays to read. I had jet lag, I had jet lag the whole ten weeks I was there. And I said, so I read them, and I said, so, so what do you think? I said, I'm on it. shit, what are you going to do? He said, so, you think I don't, I, you came here to tell me that? So I remember we had, we were having breakfast. He said, so now tell me. So I went, I met, we was in the Alps, and I walked to this top of the Alps, and I was thinking, what am I going to do? You know, it was a mystery story. Everybody was there. They were shooting two days from then. I stood at the top of this Alp, and I couldn't ski, and they wouldn't let me ski because you're not allowed to ski in film sets. So I started rolling down this Alp, and I started rolling. But what I didn't, I didn't realize is that you, if, you can't really stop rolling down an Alp once you're started. And I had this image of this huge snowball which was going to crash into all these buildings and, and Zurs, you know, and break down the... But while I was rolling, I got this idea. Then I had to think about how to stop rolling, which by itself was a trick, you know, it's a kind of a discipline. See, so I kind of rolled, I was rolling straight like this and then I twisted myself and I rolled. By the time I felt like Brando at the end of The Young Lions, I was I felt like the last Nazi found his way home, right? I came back and I said, Ivan, I know what to do now. I have this idea about how we can fix the script. And I told him, he said, so you knew this. I said, how did I know this? It's just today. He's very, I love him. He's funny. So the next morning he said, so Bill, we're having breakfast. So Bill, he said, if we, if we do this, if, you know, you can't tell anybody what we're doing, first of all. Secondly, if we do this, what can they do us? Can they sue us? You know, if we don't do the movie that everybody's here to do, but we do this other movie. And I said, Yvonne, you can't be, you'll be in worse trouble if we do the script we got. At least this way we got a chance of making a good picture. So he says, okay. Now it's on his head, really. He's the director of the movie. He's got this guy, this guy he brings over from America, who's staying in the maid's room of this enormous hotel, you know, way in. And we start rewriting this screenplay from the middle to both ends out. Omar Sharif is next, has arrived, and Karen Black is there. And day by day, and at night I work and writing it, and then he comes in and we go over it. And so very few Hollywood directors would undertake that kind of an enterprise. But... Um, I like his attitude. He's a lot of fun. When you're writing a script, um, do you use the cards? What are your methods of, of writing thrashing a out a screenplay? Um, 
Well, I try to do it as, it's hard, so I try to do it, I try to, to do it in as short a time as possible. So I try to write a screenplay within 21 days, or I make these arbitrary schedules, and then I just see it and, and, and copy it down, what I see, so that when I have to direct it, I've basically done all the work. And for direct, that's why directing for me is, is a lot more, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, in a way, because I'm just repeating myself. I think uh, Walter Hill said that uh, screenwriting was really rewriting. You know, when you write a script, it's really just the rewriting of it. Well, maybe. That's for him. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks a lot for coming on the show, Bill. Ah, it's fun to and, talk uh, to you. Yeah, well, maybe we'll have, we'll have you back when success opens. Yeah, if, and I you can time. have me back again and again. I like being Great. here. Okay. okay. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, it was fun. I saw First Position. That was an excellent documentary. Oh, good. You excellent. saw it. Yeah, I, I saw it on the east side. They had a, what was it? Yeah, the first, first Avenue screening, screening room. room. Yeah. Oh yeah, jo and Joanne Woodward, in fact, told me to go see it. I was working with her on a film. Oh, that's nice. And she nice. recommended it because she was a big ballet really? freak. I'm going to open it, that one up again, too. Excellent. I'll tell you something. I can't see why Cable would not pick that film. Pick they that never up. saw it. There's only one print of it. Excellent. And I Excellent. lost the negative. I no. lose things. I lost the negative. Can you imagine losing a negative? I lose screenplays. I lost a lot of stuff. But I'm finding my... I was lost and I'm found. Jesus Christ. Okay. Good. And? Can you sit down there for one second? I don't turn that off. Yes. Yeah. Weird damn camera. Makes me sick. This camera in the course of the 40 minute interview was just way out of white balance.